Mastering. That's a funny word. People think of mastering as this dark art, this black mystery that you can't even even mention the name of unless you've got hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of speakers, analog gear, all that kind of stuff. It could not be further from the truth. You just need to know how to approach it. And I've got kind of a, a five-step plan, five tools or five different ways of processing stuff that I like to use when I'm mastering that I think take my tracks easily to that to that next level it's not about the plugins it's not about which particular plugins you're using it's about what those plugins are doing and what those plugins are capable of so i guess in turn that kind of means that it's which ones you're using but you just need to have plugins that are capable of doing certain things in my mind anyway and then you're gonna be fine so mastering five steps first of all it's tonal balance so that's eq tonal bass middle and treble dynamics so that's compression or the opposite of compression maybe expansion could be we'll see saturation that's a big one we want it to sound nice and fat and chunky uh stereo width stereo widening stereo stuff which kind of leads on to mono as well spoiler alert we're not going to go too much into that i don't really care about it and what's the fifth limiting levels levels how loud it is how loud it is next to the next track that you can listen to it okay let's jump in let's take a listen to this track before and after and this is gain match so you can hear exactly what i've done uh and you're gonna get a feel for the loudness afterwards anyway so i'm not gonna worry about that now have a listen All right, big difference. Let's take a look at what plugins I'm using, but more importantly, how I'm using them and why I'm using them. So EQ wise, I like to think of this as kind of the, the first step of the process where you're sort of balancing things out. People will tell you a lot of things. They will say you can't possibly boost before you cut. You can't possibly cut before you boost. You can't do this, you can't do that. I just do whatever sounds right. It, it's, it's not a case of being textbook specific. There are kind of rules, but we just do whatever sounds right really in the long run, don't we? And what sounds right to me is not necessarily what sounds right to another person, but this is a stupid rule that I always do that everyone says you shouldn't do, but I do. And that's to do with limiting. I always, always, always put my limiter on first. And there's a reason for that. I'm adding like over seven dB of gain here. Okay, that's ridiculous. What I want to do is to get it up to the general loudness that I want it to be when it's going to be kind of finished and released before I start adding plugins in the chain. Why do I do that here, you ask? Well, there's no point in adding a load of bottom end, a load of top end, a load of saturation, widening, all that kind of stuff, to then stick a limiter on at the end and find, oh, and a minute, I've just ruined absolutely everything. You may ruin everything with the limiter, but it's good to know that at the beginning. It's good to know what you're going to be ruining or what you're going to be improving as you're kind of going along. So typically I'll stick a limiter on the, the final point in the chain right at the end. I might not always add that amount, but here I have. So what I'm actually going to do is on this particular limiter, which is a handy feature, is constant gain monitoring. Now a lot of um, plug-in limiters have got this and it's super handy because it means that the overall level is not going to be affected by that limiter. So essentially the level that goes in is what comes out. Essentially, you're adding 7 dB of gain, but you're not adding 7 dB of level. It's just as if you were and it's going to give you the artifacts. So for example, let's take all these plugins off and just leave us with FGX. I'm going to take it off and then bring it back in and you're going to hear the level not actually change. You're just going to hear some of the peaks kind of get clipped off a little bit. Okay, so you can hear there where I've got the limiter on, it's kind of crushing those peaks a little bit. That's going to do that regardless of whether I put it on at the beginning or the end. So I like to have that on from the get-go so I know exactly what's going on. So let's go to EQ first of all. I've actually got two EQ plugins up here. I've got Infinity EQ from Slate Digital and I've got the, uh, the Ozone 10 EQ. Now, in this track, I'm actually using Infinity EQ, but I was testing out um, the Ozone EQ as well because it has some really handy features. Both of these plugins have this same feature and it's a band solo and it is really, really handy to actually be able to listen to a specific band. So here's what people tend to do when they start to try and find some dodgy frequencies in a master. They're going to go into their EQ, they're going to make a massive, massive boost somewhere. <laughs> And 
they're going to say, okay, that sounds nasty. Let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that by loads. Then they're going to go to the next one and they're going to say, well, don't want a high shelf. Let's put that to a bell, whatever. And they're going to say, all right, let's find something else. You say that sounds nasty. If you're boosting something by six, eight, 10 dB, really, really narrow, everything sounds nasty. Don't do that. It's absolutely ridiculous. What you really want to be doing is actually just soloing in on a band and not boosting it by absolutely loads, but just listening to that specific frequency. And those are actually two very different things. So let's just reset those for a start. Come on, reset. Okay, so what we actually want to do is just take a listen to a specific frequency. So let's hold option and uh, select frequency. It's loads different. It kind of seems like it's the same thing because you're soloing just that one, but you're not making it really, really tight. You're just listening to that general kind of area. And for this track, over to Infinity EQ, I kind of felt like the low mids needed a little bit of, of de-lumping, a little bit of that taken out. Take a listen to it before and after. This is with all these bands on as well, so it's going to sound different than it just did, but whatever. So this is before and then after when I've got that in, we're going to hear it just, just declutter a little bit. And that's what we want to do with our cut EQs. We want to declutter stuff. Don't boost a load of nonsense and then find out what sounds bad. Everything will sound bad. Just take a listen to the whole track. Try and zone your ear on which area sounds a bit dodgy to you. Bring the EQ over to that frequency and then just tug that out just a little bit. Bring that on. Particularly noticeable on the bass guitar, just a few notes are a bit too resonant and they're just kind of coming out a little bit too much. To me, on this track, that is the only cut EQ I needed to do. I just needed to kind of rein that in a little bit. I've recorded this track, I've mixed it, I've done everything that I need to do on the buses and on the individual tracks because I know the way that I master, I know the way that I'm going to be uh, processing it afterwards and for me, that's the only cut that I actually needed. So I can move on to the boosts and... I'm boosting a lot of stuff because it just sounds loads better. Let's hear it without and then with, and you'll hear exactly what's going on. So one important thing is I'm taking down the uh, output by 2.2 dB, and that's because I'm adding a load of gain, and I don't want it to clip in the, the next plugin. So I'm just notching that down just a little bit so that it's a little bit not hot, not hot, a little bit colder when it comes into the next plugin. Cool. So let's discuss what I've actually got here. I've got a, a low cut here, which is at 22.4 hertz. We're not hearing that. That is for the benefit of the limiter. So it's not reading all that super, super low end information of which there was a fair amount. So I'm just getting rid of that. It's not a massively steep slope. It's, what is it? 6 dB per octave. So it's, it's really quite shallow. Is that the right word? But I like to just get rid of that super, super low end. A lot of people will do it in the top end as well. But for me, this track didn't particularly need it. And then of that overall bottom end, I'm actually bringing that up as well. Now this seems kind of counterintuitive by cutting out some low end and then bringing it up as well. But if we have a look at our curve, we can see that that cut still retains the kind of get rid of the baseness. So I'm just boosting at kind of this area here, which is around, I don't know, just below 50 hertz. You can see 50 hertz here. It's just below that, just around that area. It's for the thump of the kick drum. It's for that, that real sub information, not really sub, the really low information. I've got rid of all that super sub, but let's take a listen to uh, this with the, the bottom end engaged and just hear how it kind of just adds a little bit of lift in that bottom end. So without it. Without it. Cool. It's just adding a little bit of a little bit of lift in that in that low end, which I really liked. Now, something that I typically do on uh, on a master is I'll use a mid side EQ. So Ozone's good for that. Infinity EQ is good for that as well. You can essentially EQ just the mid channel or just the side channel. I'll tend to do that on to kind of zone in on the guitars and give it a little bit of a mid boost. But I'm actually doing that later on in the chain, which I'll show you. So I'm giving everything an overall boost at two two and a half k, something like that. Before it. <laughs> 
just adding some clarity. And with a top end boost. That's really the symbols. So these two are kind of achieving a similar thing. This top end is the clarity and the cymbals, and this mid-range boost is the, the electric guitars and the snare drum. It's just giving them a little, little kind of extra pop. I'm boosting a lot here and not cutting very much. Many people will tell you that is wrong. It sounds right in this track. It doesn't make it sound too bright. It doesn't overload anything. It's just helping to kind of make everything cut through. And for me, this EQ is everything that I needed. So stereo information, as I said, I'm not really too fussed about mono stuff. This track, I've checked it in mono and it sounds fine, but I only checked it because I knew I was going to say it sounds fine in mono. 99% of the time, I'm not even, even worried about that. I don't find that anyone who listens to tracks that I really produce or master or whatever is actually listening to much on mono stuff. Most of the time, it's headphones, it's stereo, whole other thing. I've never, ever, I don't think, had anyone come back and say... Yeah, we like it, but it sounds mono. No one's ever said that. So it's not, to me, that tells me everything I need to know. So what I'm actually doing here though, for the stereo stuff is I'm spreading just the uh, high frequencies and high mids. So from, what's that? 1.3K onwards. Just spreading that just a little bit. I'm gonna put this off and then on. It's subtle and it's mainly on the guitars, but it's just kind of widening them out a bit. Just spreading them out a bit and it's effective. It works in this track. So, just hear them kind of get thrown out a little bit. Let's go to the chorus, take it out, and then bring it in. There you go. Now, a lot of people will tell you that you need to mono the uh, the low end. Yeah, you kind of do sometimes, but to me, the low end wasn't actually non-mono it wasn't stereo in any way the only bottom end stuff that i've got in here was the bass guitar which was in the center anyway the kick drum which was in the center anyway there's not a massive amount of real low end in those guitars which are panned to the left and right um so i didn't particularly need to so that's the only stereo consideration i'm actually making in this track you may find depending on what kind of music you're creating that sometimes you need a little bit more or a little bit less. If you're doing something acoustic, then it may be that at the mastering stage, you can add a natural uh, reverb kind of sound, not like a massive cathedral, but like a room reverb, and that will be spread out to the left and right. Everyone says you shouldn't use reverb at mastering. I disagree. If the track needs it, then why shouldn't you use that? And that's going to be a real kind of stereo thing. So stereo-ness in mastering to me is about a feel. It's about sitting in front of the speakers and having stuff coming from the left and right as opposed to directly in front of you. If it's not coming from the left and right, then why isn't it coming from the left and right? What is it about that? that source or that piece of audio that necessitates it coming straight from the middle. To me, guitars and maybe cymbals should be wrapped around you. They should be far out. So that's exactly what I've done here. I've just spread out the uh, the top end and the mid range from 1.3K onwards. And alongside the EQ, that's really helping to, to brighten this track. I've done this stereo widening uh, after the EQ though. So I've boosted that mid range and the top end in Infinity EQ. And you'll see it's at, what's that, 2.3K. And then this is at like 10K or something ridiculous. Oh, 7K. So everything there, 2.3 upwards is kind of getting boosted. And then I'm spreading it. So I'm boosting it and then spreading it. To me, that works better. Now, this next section is dynamics. And I approach this in a few different ways. I do use compression. I do use overall master bus compression. But I use something else before that, which I think... I've never found another plugin that does what this plugin does. And it's actually, this is not a slight digital advert, but this is actually another slight digital plugin. And this is uh, Bomber. Now, this is, I don't know. I don't really know what this is. It's a dynamic thing. It's kind of a transient thing. And to me, it's that transient emphasis stuff that I'm really using. I'm using it because it helps stuff poke out. It creates maybe some saturation as well. I'm not sure it adds some overall kind of girth, but it kind of adds a little bit of punch on absolutely everything. I'm going to take it out and then bring it in again, and you're going to hear what it does. Happy, 
So it just adds maybe a little brightening, even though it's on the fat setting and a little bit of kind of transient stuff. I've got the intensity relatively low down. They say what you're meant to do here is bring the drive up until it hits that bomb, until it's in the middle, and then bring the intensity up. I've kind of done that-ish. Um, if I bring it up too much, though, it kind of adds a little bit too much. Uh, it's like an expander. It kind of taking those transients and making them really poke out. Have a listen if I bring this intensity up too much. Just gets a little bit too snappy and that's not really what i want so round 35 is generally where i like to keep it just adds an overall lift and a little bit of snap to the transients which i'm doing before i go into a compressor i've never tried it the other way around don't think i really want to but i've got a compressor after it which means that i'm bringing those transients up and then compressing because my compressor is to add some overall mastering glue. It's to add some overall kind of warmth, some overall kind of tightness to the mix. I'm not aiming to bring down loads and loads of transients by very much. So to me, bringing the transients up with something like Bomber in the first place means that when they go into that compressor, even though they're bringing them down, they're not gonna be brought down by as much. And that's kind of a tonal dynamic thing as well, but you'll see what I mean. So again, oh, I need to stop using Slate Digital Plugins. I've got another Slate Digital Plugin here, and this is FGX1. I've got FGX2 on the main, the limiter, but the FGX1, the compressor, I'm not saying it's any different to FGX2. I've actually done a video on FGX2, like a first look when it first came out. Check it out up whichever side, somewhere, wherever it is. But I actually like the compressor in the first one because I'm used to it. You don't have as many, you don't have as much kind of control over stuff. You don't have specific constants in the attack and release. You, here you just kind of have arbitrary numbers. And I sort of like arbitrary numbers to an extent. If you've got them in FGX2, then it says in specific milliseconds. But I'm kind of used to this one. So I turn everything else off. I keep the meters on just because I didn't turn them off. Um, and I just like this compressor. It just sounds great. I'm keeping a, a really low ratio, just below 1.5 to 1. Threshold is just taking off a dB or two. Slow attack fast release take a listen to it before and take a listen to it after it's not really adding any level it's just adding some just adding some squash some glue it's just adding some kind of togetherness let's bring it to the chorus again And the great thing about this compressor is I'm taking off like less than one dB and it's just giving a little bit of kind of hugging of the sound. I can bring that threshold down. And it's making it quieter because that's the nature of it, but it's not actually killing it too much to my ear anyway. I like it kind of where it was, but even if you've got uh, more extreme threshold settings the ratio being down nicely below 1.5 to 1 is just adding a gentle kind of hugging to the sound and um, it's not killing anything too much but it's just you know it's just molding everything together a bit so to me that's what compression is about at the master As aside from which compressor i'm using it's what that compressor is doing and i'm not killing transients i'm not really shaving off peaks like 1176 style i'm just squashing things just slightly very low ratios very high thresholds slow attacks fast release so it's just taming things a little bit and just gradually kind of bringing everything in the release typically people will maybe have that a little bit slower on a master but i like to kind of have it a little bit a little bit lower a little bit faster Okay, so we've done EQ, we've kind of looked at limiting, we've done stereo widening, and we've done compression, dynamics, bomber, all that kind of stuff. There's two different plugins that I use for saturation, and sometimes it's an either or, sometimes it's a both thing. And one of them is a Sonox plugin, this is Inflator, and the other one, oh, again, it's Slate Digital. I just kind of like Slate Digital for mastering. I don't know what it is. Uh, in a minute though, I'm gonna show you what my master sounds like compared to Ozone's uh, Master Assistant. And it annoyed me because it sounds great, but let's just have a look at this. So I'm gonna turn that off because that's really annoying. So I've got two types of saturation here. I've got the Virtual Tape Machines and I've got the Sonox Inflator. No idea what Sonox Inflator does. It's just a, a goodifier. It just makes it sound really, really cool. Uh, let's turn the 
virtual tank machines off first of all and we'll bring this off and then we'll bring it back in again and just hear what it's doing it's just adding some well it is saturation to my ears it's just adding some overall kind of togetherness and to me saturation is doing an extension of what my compression is doing it's adding that that whole hugging of the sound but it's just bringing up that low level stuff adding some kind of low mid warmth to it some low end warmth and just kind of hugging in the sound making it a little bit more you know let's go for it little bit in the tops there as well Yeah, so that's adding that warmth, that togetherness in the lows and low mids. Um, and it's adding a little bit of spark on the top end as well. It's not really a dynamic thing. It's kind of an EQ thing, but it's just a, a broad kind of broad stroke, adding a little bit of sheen to it. Um, I don't really know in, in general terms what it's doing, but I like what it's doing. Saturation as a tool is going to add some molding, some togetherness and sometimes a little bit of top as well. But the uh, FGX2 doesn't do anything to the top end, to my ear, in this instance. So I've got this arm, um, well, I've got an arm, um, oh, all this. I don't know. The only thing I'm really worried about is that it's on two track, because to me that sounds better. Don't know why, it just does. I don't even worry about any of this kind of nonsense. Uh, let's hear it without it on, um, and then with it on, um, and this is where the bottom end really comes to life. It's just adding some grinds to those guitars as well. It's it's just such a, a bottom end machine. And then it just sounds great in the chorus, off and on. Yeah, just sounds awesome. I think there was some kind of marketing blurb that said it just makes it sound like a record. And I hate to agree, but it, it just kind of does. It just brings everything together and just, just makes it sound phenomenal. So to me, those are the five key steps in a mastering chain. You've got your tonal considerations, your EQ. You've got your um, dynamic considerations, your compression, or if you're adding any spikiness or taking the spikiness away spikiness in terms of like transients your stereo widening or stereo narrowing maybe in this case it was widening just of those those high and high mid frequencies then you've got your your saturation which is your overall kind of togetherness your overall sort of squashiness limiting we kind of covered at the beginning but that is just to say i'm not actually doing anything with this limiter like there's loads of stuff you can do in this limiter fgx2 you can change the modes you can change low punch detail i often do that stuff but in this case I didn't. I just wanted to add a load of level. So if we actually take that constant gain monitoring off, we're going to get the really loud version. I'm not going to do that now because that would be really loud. Um, but without it, it, it just gives those peaks just room to clip. And you, you don't want to do that. If you've got this ceiling set to minus 1 dB, then that just means if anything goes to MP3, you've got a better chance of it not actually clipping. Not going to go too much into that, but that's just kind of a nice safety net. One thing I like about FGX2 actually is if you um, bring this down and then bring it up, it just kind of clamps onto minus one because it knows. It knows you want to be at that minus one point. Nice move. Uh, so I'm adding 7 dB of gain. That's ridiculous. It's a lot. It really is a lot. But let's see what my actual um, loudness units is. I said I wasn't going to go into metering, but let's do it. I think it's going to be pretty high. I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess like minus nine, maybe. Let's find out. Ah, uh, my LUFS ometer was a little bit off. Okay, minus 10. That's still pretty loud. The written thing is that Spotify goes for minus 14, whether it does or not. Different story. But to me, this limiter, all it's doing, I'm not applying any compression, no mid-side stuff, none of this nonsense, none of this, none of absolutely anything. All I'm doing, taking this down to minus one and then adding a load of gain. And that is getting my overall level. I hope that's been useful for you. I hope you can apply this to your productions, to your masters, to your tracks, to take it to the next stage, to give it that extra mastering sheen. Just to finish off, I want to show you what it's like when I play this track through Ozone Master Assistant, because to me, so Master Assistant is, like, I genuinely do like Master Assistant. I, I genuinely really think that it gets a great sound. Some people will say they prefer to do it themselves, whatever. But 
To me, if Master Assistant makes it sound a certain way and I can make it sound a similar way, then I've done my job because I'm making it sound kind of mastered and making it sound pretty good. And Master Assistant got really, really similar results to what I did. So let's just unhide this track. That's the reference. We're going to have a look at Ozone. So just take a listen to what Ozone has done. And I was really surprised because I thought that it was going to be well, I don't know what I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be completely different for a start. But if I just flick back between Ozone and mine, there's a lot of similarities there. So I think Ozone has favoured a little bit more of the bottom end kind of girth and I've favoured a little bit more top end sparkle. Um, I'm not going to go into Ozone now because there's, there's a lot going on in there. But to me, that does sound really, really good. And I think for a kind of quick fix for a one stop shop, it's great. But the thing about that kind of tool is it's fine if it achieves the sound that you want. But as soon as it doesn't quite hit the mark, you then need to know what these tools are doing. So you can then go in and kind of change things a little bit. Oh, it sounds too this or it sounds not enough in this way. You need to be able to know how to fix those issues. And once you get a grasp on EQ, dynamic, saturation, all the things we've covered here, then you're in a far better position to go in and change stuff. Or if you've done like I've done, go in from the ground up and really start to sculpt your track and make it into a finished master. Hopefully that's been useful for you. I'll see you again soon. Take care.